section eight of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 8 King of Prussia. Reported tale of a smuggler, a revenue cutter, and an officious minister. Part 1 you have heard tell of course of captain john carter the famous smuggler of prussia cove and his brothers harry francis and charles and captain will richards tummels carpenter hosking uncle billy and the rest of the cove boys likewise of old nan lego and bessie busso that kept the kiddlywink there footnote a kiddlywink is a drinking house end of footnote well well i see our youngsters going to school nowadays with their hair brushed and i hear them singing away inside the classroom for all the world as if they were glad to grow up and pay taxes and it makes me wonder if they can be the children of that old fangled race sometimes i think it's high time for me to go there was a newspaper fellow down here when the general walker came ashore and after asking a lot of questions he put the case in a nutshell you're a link with the past he said that's what you are i don't know if he invented the expression or if he picked it up somewhere and used it on me but it's a terrible clever one you mustn't think i'm boasting i never knew captain john he died in the year seven and i wasn't born for twelve months after but i've shaken hands with captain harry the one who was taken prisoner by the french and came near to losing his head he spent his latter years farming at rinsey and local preaching a very earnest man he gave me my first-class ticket that was in the late twenties and not long before his death and captain will richards i knew well he took over the business after captain john and lasted down to the crimea year i carried the coffin eighty-five his age was according to the plate on it but of course the business had come to an end long before everybody calls it prussia cove in these days the visitors ask for prussia cove and go and crane their heads over you know the place just east of cudden point it's three coves really piskey's cove bessie's cove and prussia the first has no good landing but plenty of good caves east of that comes bessie's where the kedleywink stood with a harbour cut in the solid rock and a roadway and more caves and east of that with a point and a small island dividing them comes prussia where john carter had his house before his time it was called porthlea and he got the nickname king of prussia as a boy and it stuck to him and now it sticks to the old place the visitors crane their heads over for you must do that to count the vessels in the harbour right underneath you and ask foolish questions and get answered with a pack of lies there's an old tale for one about a fellow who heard that the real king of prussia had been defeated by napoleon bonaparte ah says he i'm sorry for that man misfortunes never come single not more than six weeks ago he lost three hundred keg of brandy by information so i'm told all nonsense porthlea never lost but one keg in all john carter's time and that was a leaky one in a pool at piskey's which the custom-house fellows sniffed as they went by to be sure one day when the king was away from home the collector came round from penzance seized a cargo and carried it off to the custom-house store what did carter do when he came home and heard about it he had agreed to deliver the goods by a certain day 
his character for honest business was at stake and he wasn't going to disappoint his customers so he rode into penzance that night broke open the custom-house store and rode back with all his kegs nothing else mind you when the officers next morning discovered what had happened they allowed at once this was carter's work because he was an honest man and wouldn't take anything that didn't belong to him but the tale they tell oftenest is about the battery he kept on ennis point and how he opened fire with it upon his majesty's vessel and i want you to have the rights of that as i had it from captain will richards himself to hear folk speak you would think the king just opened fire and blazed away for the fun of it whereas with all his daring he was the quietest most inoffensive man in the trade if only you let him alone mr wern the collector understood this and it was not by his fault either that the firing came about but all through an interfering woman and a preacher who couldn't mind his own business it began in this way bessie busso had a sister-in-law married and living over here in ardivora anne geen was the name of her a daughter of kitty lamal you've heard tell of kitty lamal and her eight daughters and her stocking full of guineas no well there's another story for you one of these days this anne was the youngest of the eight and married john geen latish in life just in time to bring him a boy before he left her a widow and after her mother kitty died she and the boy lived together in the old house at carney glaze Ugne's house footnote huguenot's house and a footnote they used to call it the boy being the son of old parents was a lean scrag-necked child with a lolloping big head too clever for his years he had the lamal's pluck inside him though for all his unhandy looks and of course his mother thought him a nun such well with all the country talking about john carter and his doings you may fancy that every boy in ardivora wanted to grow up in a hurry and be off to prussia cove a smuggling it took young phoby gain his real name was diphobus as bad as the rest he had been over to the cove with his mother on a visit to bessie busso and there in the kidleywink the king had patted him on his big head and given him a shilling after that the boy gave his mother no peace she poor soul wanted to make a preacher of him and wouldn't hear of his going but often after he had turned fifteen she would be out of bed ten times of a night and listening at his door to make sure he hadn't run off in the dark i told you the boy was clever and this is how he gained his end there had always been a tale that the ugnes house was haunted the ghost being old reginald bottrell kitty lamont's father a very respectable sea captain who died in his bed with no reason whatever for being uncomfortable in the next world still walk he did or was said to and one fine day the boy came to his mother with a pretty tale it went that the evening before he and his young cousin arklas bryant had been lying stretched on their stomachs before the fire in the big room he reading the pilgrim's progress by the light of the turves and arklas listening the boys were waiting for their supper and for mrs geen to come back from her saturday's shopping happening to look up as he turned a page phoby saw on the steps which led down into the room a brisk stout little gentleman dressed in a long cutaway coat black velvet waistcoat and breeches black ribbed stockings and pump shoes tied with a bow he twinkled with brass or gilt buttons one row down the coat and two rows down the waistcoat and each button was stamped with a pattern of flowers his head was bald except for a bit of hair at the back he had no hat and when he turned after closing the door behind him 
phoby took notice that his belly was round and as tight as a drum the boy denied being frightened the gentleman he said was most pleasant looking in all his features i didn't take him for a spirit but for somebody come to see mother i stood up and said good evening sir mother'll be back in a minute or two if you'll take a seat i'm not come for she but for thee he said diphobus keen idle no longer arise take my advice and go a smuggling and with that he vanished through the door the boy pitched this tale to his mother and arklaus packed him up adding that the ghost had turned to him and said thou too arklaus in a year's time shall be a smuggler perhaps sooner he told this to his father and got strapped for it but mrs geen came of a family that believed in ghosts the boy's tale described his grandfather to a hair which was not wonderful considering how often she had talked to phoby about the old man at any rate after being in two minds for a week she gave way after a fashion and allowed phoby to run over to prussia cove to his aunt bessie busso and bessie who loved spirit had him apprenticed to hosking the cove carpenter pretty carpenter's work hosking was likely to teach him now after the way of women the deed was no sooner done than mrs geen began to repent it she knew very well that her dear boy would run into danger but she kept her trouble to herself until there arrived at ardivora a new methodist preacher called meekin in those days john wesley himself used to pay us a visit pretty well every august or september but this year for some reason or other he gave us an extra revival and sent down this meekin to us at the beginning of june for a very good reason he was never sent again he started very well indeed you couldn't call him much to look at he had a long pair of legs which seemed differently jointed to yours and mine no shoulders nor stomach to speak of no coloured hair and a glazing watery eye but the wonder began when you heard his voice it filled his clothes out suddenly like one of those india-rubber squeakers the children blow at whitson fair and coming from a man whose looks were all against him it made you feel humble-minded for having been so quick to judge i think he had found out the value of this kind of surprise and went about neglecting his appearance on purpose as i say he started very well he preached at the stenach on saturday and next day near the market-place for the sake he said of those who could not climb the hill though to be sure they needn't have left their doors to hear him a mile off there was a tidy gathering farm carts and market carts and gigs from all parts of the country round almost as many as if he had been john wesley himself he preached again at five o'clock in the evening and so fired up mrs geen that by ten next morning she was down at nance's house where he lodged laying all her trouble before him mr meekin heard her out and then took a line which altogether surprised her he seemed to care less for the danger her phoby was running than for the crime he was committing yes he called it a crime as a christian woman he said you must know his soul's in danger what in comparison with that does his body matter mrs geen hadn't any answer for this so what she said was my phoby have never given me a day's trouble since his teething and then seeing the preacher was upset and wishing to keep things as pleasant as possible she went on i don't see no crime in learning to be a carpenter by your own showing said mr meekin he is in danger of being led into smuggling by wild companions nothing wild about john carter 
she held out a married man and as steady as you could wish to see a man with convictions of sin as i know and two of his brothers saved you couldn't hear a prettier preacher than charles and john he always runs a freight most careful i never heard of any wildness at all in connection with he not a whisper the preacher fairly stamped and began tapping the palm of his hand with his forefinger but the smuggling ma'am that's what i call your attention to the smuggling itself is not only a crime but a sin every bit as much a sin as the violence and swearing which go with it no swearing at all said anne geen you don't know john carter or you wouldn't suggest such a thing every man that swears in his employ is docked sixpence out of his pay my sister-in-law keeps the money in a box over her chimney-piece and they drink it out together come christmas by this the preacher was fairly dancing woman he shouted soon as he could recover his mouth speech i'm no such thing said she up at once and very indignant and your master john wesley would never have said it the preacher took a gulp and tried a quieter tack i beg your pardon ma'am says he but you seem to be wilfully misunderstanding me let us confine ourselves to smuggling says he very well says she i'm agreeable i tell you then that it's a sin it's defrauding the king just as much as if you dipped your hand into his majesty's pocket i shouldn't dream of being so familiar said mrs geen but he didn't hear her and if you'll permit me i'll explain how that is he said well she allowed folding the shawl about her which she always wore in the hottest weather you can say what you mind to about it so long as you help me get my phoby back that's what i come for i dare say now you've sometimes heard it brought up against us in these parts that we're like the men of athens always ready to listen to any new thing the preacher took up his parable then and there and being as i say an able man in spite of his looks within half an hour he had actually convinced the woman that there was something to be ashamed of in smuggling and as soon as he'd done that nothing would satisfy her but to hire the pony cart from the georgian dragon and drive the preacher to prussia cove the very next day to rescue her boy from these evil companions twould be a great thing to convince john carter she said and a feather in your cap and even if you don't the place is worth seeing and he usually kills a pair of ducks for visitors so early the next day tuesday june fourth away they started and the day being hot and the pony slow arrived at bessie busso's about four o'clock tis a pretty peaceable spot on a june afternoon with the sun dropping out to sea and right against your eyes and this day the cove seemed more peaceable than ordinary the boats at anchor no sound of work at all and scarcely a sign of life but the smoke from bessie bussow's chimney where's my boy was the first question mrs geen put to her sister-in-law after the two women had kissed each other out seenin answered bessie as prompt as you please but most likely he'll be home some time to-night the master's got a new steamboat and all the boys be out working her there's not a soul left in the cove barring the master himself and uncle billy well i'm glad of my life the boy's at such innocent work but i've come to see john carter and take him away the preacher here says that smuggling is a sin and the soul's destruction he's quite sure of it in his own mind and while there's any doubt i don't want my phoby to risk it ah said bessie i'd dearly like to hear how he makes that out 
but i ain't got time to be talking just now you'd best take him across and let him try to persuade john carter while i get your room ready i saw john going towards his house ten minutes ago and i sworn he'll offer the preacher a bed and listen to all he's got to say so having stabled the pony mrs geen and the preacher walked over to carter's house together they found the king in his kitchen parlour divided between his accounts and a mug of cider and he made them welcome being always fond of preachers and having a great respect for anne geen because of her family there was a great heap of shavings in the fireplace for the room was a sunny one facing south by west but the king told her where to find some tea that had never paid duty and she took off her bonnet and boiled the kettle in the kitchen at the back and it wasn't till they'd drunk a cup that she explained what had brought her and called on the preacher to wrestle captain john listened very politely or seemed to and nodded his head at the right time but he couldn't help being a bit absent-minded fact was he expected a cargo home that very evening and didn't feel so easy about it as usual up to now he had always run his stuff in goodish sized vessels luggers or cutter rigged craft running up to fifty or sixty tons as we should reckon now but captain will richards had taken a great fancy to the causan planned of using light built open rowboats or you might say galleys pulling eight oars and put together to pass for scene boats after the war when there was no longer any privateering vessels like captain carter's carrying eighteen or twenty guns apiece couldn't pretend to be other than smugglers or pirates and then these make-believe scene boats came into use everywhere but just now they were a novelty the king persuaded by richards ordered one down from causand and had already used it once or twice to meet his larger craft somewhere in a good offing and transship their cargoes by this he could run his kegs ashore at any state of the tide leaving the empty vessels to be watched or overhauled by the customs fellows but this time the weather being fine and settled and the winds light he was trying a faster game and had sent the scene boat right across channel to roscoff keeping his sailing craft in harbour it would be dark before nine no moon till after midnight and by all calculations the boat ought to make the cove between ten and eleven after lying well outside and waiting her chance it all seemed promising enough but somehow the king couldn't be quite easy however he listened quietly and the preacher talked away for one solid hour until uncle billy lego who had been keeping watch all the afternoon came knocking at the door you'll excuse me a minute said the king and went outside to hear the report the weather had been flat calm all day with a slow ground swell running into the cove but with the cool of the evening a light offshore breeze had sprung up and uncle billy had just seen the revenue cutter stealing out from penzance botheration said captain carter and fined himself sixpence then he went back to the parlour and the preacher started afresh twice again before supper came uncle billy with news of the cutter's movements and the second time there could be no mistaking them for she was dodging back and forth and lying foxy around cudden point all through supper the preacher talked on and on and the king ate without knowing what he was eating he couldn't afford to lose this cargo yet mr collector wern meant business this time and would collar the boat to a certainty unless she were warned off but to show a light from the coast meant a hundred pounds fine or twelve months hard labour the king slewed round in his chair and looked at the great pile of shavings in the fireplace a hundred pounds fine with the chance of burning the house thatch about his ears end of section eight
section nine of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quillercouch. Section 9. King of Prussia. Reported tale of a smuggler, a revenue cutter, and an officious minister. Part 2. Supper over, he and his guests turned their chairs towards the fireplace. The king took flint and steel and struck a match, lit his pipe, and stared at the shavings, then dropped the light on the floor, ground it out with his heel, and puffed away thoughtfully. The preacher went on talking. "'Render unto Caesar tribute to whom tribute is due. That applies to King George to-day every bit so much as it did to Caesar.' caesar and king george be two different persons said captain john stopping his pipe with his thumb the principle's the same i don't see it said the captain i read my bible and it says that caesar ordered the whole world to be taxed now that sense caesar didn't go niggling away with the duty on silk here and another on brandy there and another on tea and another on east india calicoes mind you i've got no personal failing against king george but it does annoy me to see a man calling himself king of england and making money in these petty ways it's his birthday to-day put in mrs Geen, though i didn't remember it till i saw the flag on ardevora church tower this morning is it then we'll drink his health ma'am to show there's no animosity captain john fetched a bottle of brandy and glasses and mixed drinks for his guests then he took his seat reached out for flint and steel again and says he very quietly i wish the boys were at home we'd have a bonfire up to also that's where i come from said the preacher we always kept up his majesty's birthday with a bonfire and fireworks but you don't seem so loyal in these parts fireworks did you now captain john set down the tinder-box and rubbed his chin well said he going to a cupboard and glancing up on his way at the tall clock as it happens i've a rocket or two here though to be sure it seems like a waste with nobody left in the cove to see or raise so much as a chair it's the spirit of the thing that counts said the preacher they've lain here so long captain john went on in a sort of musing way they may be mildewed for all i know you leave that to me said the preacher i knows all about fireworks there don't seem nothing wrong about this one he said taking it and fingering the fuse may i have a try with em try and welcome i don't understand these things for my part i only know they takes up a lot of room in the cupboard and i'll be glad to see the last of em so out into the night they three went together but when they had the rocket fixed captain john was taken that poorly he had to come back and sit in the chair and rub his thighs and his stomach and when sitting there he heard the rocket go up whoosh he had to rub them the harder it went off capital called the preacher popping his head in at the door can't us try another and now captain john had to rub his eyes before turning to him take the lot he said and pushed the whole bundle into the preacher's hands ah if king george had a few more friends like you take the lot of em loyal man he fairly thrust him out to door and had to lean a hand there before he could follow feeling weak all over to think of collector wern and his men and what their faces must be like 
down in the revenue cutter but he had no time to taste the fun of it properly for just then he heard bessie bussow's voice outside asking questions all of a screech the first rocket had fetched her over hot foot and agog and the captain had to run out and stop her tongue and send her home with anne Geen. but they didn't go till the preacher had touched off every single rocket stepping back as they went whoosh whoosh and waving his hat and crying god save the king god save the king cried captain john after him and bessie stood wondering if the end of the world had come or the master had gone clean out of his wits the captain used to try and explain it afterwards when he told the story you've seen a woman in hysterics he'd say and you know how a man feels when he wants to drop work and go on the drink for a week well it wasn't exactly one or t'other with me but a little like both i'm a level-headed tradesman and known for such but if ever that chap walks into my house again i'll be wise and go straight out by the back door and put myself under restraint after the women had gone he took the fellow back to the kitchen and sat putting questions to him in a reverent sort of voice and eyeing him as awesome as billy bennett when he hooked the mermaid until the poor creature talked himself sleepy and asked to be shown to his room captain carter saw him to bed came downstairs to the parlour again and spread himself on the sofa for forty winks for between the boat dodging out to sea and the pack-horses waiting ready up at trannell's farm above the hill there was no going to bed for him that night he had been sleeping maybe for two hours when a whistle fetched him to his feet and out of the door like a scout "'Twas nothing more nor less than the boy's arrival signal, and this was what had happened. When the preacher's first rocket went off, the collector, down on board the cutter, was taking his bit of supper in the cabin. At the sound of it he rushed up the companion and found all his crew on deck, with their necks cricked back, barring one man, who that moment popped his head up through the forehatchway what on earth was that he asked a rocket sir said the chief boatman just sent up from prussia cove mr wern couldn't find his breath for a moment but when he did twas to say very well john carter i've a got you this time my dandy i don't quite understand how you come to be such a fool but that rocket costs you a hundred pounds and if i'm not mistaken i'll have your cargo pawn top of it the breeze still blew pretty steady and gave orders to stand out into the bay get an offing and keep a sharp lookout as the moon rose he knew that all carter's ordinary craft except the scene boat were quiet at anchor at bessie's cove but he reckoned that the boat had gone out this time to meet and unload a stranger he never dreamed she would be crossing all the way to roscoff and back on her own account he knew too that carter had a spot near mousehole to fall back upon when a landing at prussia cove couldn't be worked so he stood out to put the cutter on a line commanding both places which with the soldier's wind then blowing was easy enough and as she pushed out her nose past cudden point the whole sky began to bang with rockets this puzzled him fairly as carter knew it would and it puzzled the cove boys in the scene boat as they lay on their oars about three miles from shore and discussed the first warning but in one of the flashes captain harry carter who was commanding spied the cutter's sails quite plain under the dark of the land plain enough to see that she was running out free he knew that he couldn't have been seen by her in the heave of the swell for the scene boat lay pretty low with her heavy cargo and he'd given her a lick of grey paint at roscoff by way of extra precaution so thought he a signal's a signal but brother john doesn't know what i know let the cutter stand out as she's going and we'll nip in round the tail of her 
she can't follow into the cove with her draught even if she spies us and by daybreak we'll have the best part of the cargo landed and so he did muffling oars and crossing over a mile to southward of the cutter and after that weigh all and pull for the cove the preacher at john carter's and mrs gean at bessie bussow's both woke early next morning but mrs gean was first by a good hour and what pulled the preacher out of bed was the sound of guns he put his head out of window and could hardly believe it was the peaceful place he'd come upon last evening the beach swarmed with men like emmets near up by high water mark men were unloading a long boat for dear life some passing kegs others slinging them to horses others running the horses up the cliff under his window at first he thought it must be their trampling had woken him out of sleep but the next moment bang the room shook all about him a cloud of smoke drifted up towards him from the ennis point and through it while twas clearing he saw john carter and another man run to the battery and begin to load again with mrs gean behind them waving a rammer and dancing like a paper woman in a cyclone below the mouth of the cove tossed a boatload of men pulling and backing with their heads ducked their faces on a level with their shoulders and all turned back towards the battery while a big red-faced man stood up in the stern sheets shaking his fist and dancing almost as excitedly as mrs gean still farther out a fine cutter lay rocking on the swell her bosom swinging and sails shaking in the flat calm the preacher dragged on his clothes somehow tore out of the house and down to the point as fast as legs would carry him Wha what's the meaning of this he screeched rushing up to captain john who was sighting one of his three little nine-pounders blessed if i know said the captain we was a peaceable lot enough till you and mrs gean came a-visiting but you too would play hamlet's ghost with a quaker meeting it's my phoby they're after my phoby screamed mrs gean and then she turned on the fellow behind captain john it was hosking once a man-of-war's man and now supposed to be teaching her boy the carpentry trade this is what you bring in to is it you deceiver you you barefaced villain the man had a beard as big as a furze bush look at the poor lamb up there loadin the hosses and to think i bore and reared em for this if you let one of they fellows lay hands on my phoby i'll scratch out every eye in your head stand by tim says the captain quietly drat the boat if she keeps bobbiting about like that i shall hit her sure enough bang went the little gun and kicked backwards clean over its carriage the shot whizzed about six feet above the boat and plunged into the heaving swell between it and the cutter bit too near that i don't want to hurt roger Wern, though he do make such tempting ugly faces but what do they want what are they after stuttered the preacher they're after my phoby cried mrs gean not a bit of it said captain john good-humouredly from all i can see it's the preacher here they want to call her me screams the poor man me well if you will go letting off rockets i don't know what it costs up to walzo or wherever you come from but down in these parts tis a hundred pound or twelve calendar months the preacher turned white and began to shake all of a sudden like a leaf but i didn't mean i'd had no idea you don't intend to tell me he stammered here tummels captain john hailed a man who came running down to lend a hand with the guns take the preacher here and fix him on one of the horses sling a keg each side of him if he looks like tumbling off sorry to hurry you sir he explained but tis for your good you must clear out of this before the officers get sight of your face and i don't know how much longer i can frighten em off 
when you get up to trenel you can cast loose and run and it mayn't be time wasted if you make up an alibi as you go along it don't seem hospitable i grant ye, but as a smuggler you're too enterprising for this little out-of-the-way cove tummels led the preacher away in too much of a daze to answer he opened his mouth but at that moment bang went hosking with another of the guns by and by captain john let out a chuckle as he saw the poor man moving up the cliff track swaying between two kegs and clutching at his horse's mane every time tummels smacked the beast on the rump the horse he rode was almost the last by seven o'clock the boys had cleared the whole of their cargo and still the preventive boat hung in the mouth of the cove pulling and backing and waiting for the chance captain john never allowed them you see captain harry having dodged in behind the cutter without being spied had a pretty start with the unloading when day broke mr wern finding no scene-boat or suspicious craft in sight and allowing that there was no fear of another attempt before nightfall had stood down again for prussia cove meaning to send in a boat for the cutter drew too much water and have it out with captain carter about the rockets you can fancy his face when he came abreast the entrance and found the boys working like a hive of bees as for resistance the king always swore he hadn't an idea of it till mrs geen put it into his head the battery was never intended for more than show she's a wonderful woman he declared but he had a monstrous respect for all the lemos blood in every one of em he said but of course the fun wasn't finished yet soon after seven and after the last of the cargo had been salved under their eyes the preventive men drew off by a quarter past eight wern had worked the cutter in as close as he dared and then opened fire with his guns the first shot struck the taty patch in front of carter's house the second plunked into the water not fifteen yards from the gun's muzzle in the swell running she could make no practice at all though she kept it up till midday the boys behind the battery ran out and cheered whenever one flew extra wide and this made wern mad will richards tummels and young phoby Geen posted themselves in shelter behind the captain's house and whenever a shot buried itself in the soft cliff one of them would run with a tubble and dig it out all this time uncle bill lego having finished loading up the kegs was carting water from the stream on the beach to the kitchen garden above the house and his old sister nan leading the horses for it was a two-horse job richards called to him to leave out it was too dangerous now there said uncle bill i've been thinking of nan and the hosses this brave while at noon wern ceased firing and sent off a boat towards penzance the cove boys still held the battery and the two parties had their dinners lit their pipes and studied each other all the long afternoon but towards five o'clock a riding company arrived to help the law and opened a musket fire on the rear of the battery from the hedge at the top of the hill the game was up now the boys scattered and took shelter in bessie bussow's house and captain john having hoisted a flag of truce waited for wern and his boat with all the calmness in life a pretty day's work this was the collector's first word as he stepped ashore amusin from first to last agreed captain john in his cordial way says the collector slowly well tastes differ you may be right of course but we'll begin at the beginning and see how it works out first then at nine forty five last night you showed an unauthorized light for the purpose of cheating the revenue cost of that caper one hundred pounds be you talkin of the rockets course i be well then i didn't fire them nor any one belongin to the cove 
i didn't set any one to fire them and they weren't fired to warn anybody let alone i have proof they was sent up by a methody preacher to relieve his feelings you've known me too long roger Wern, to think me fool enough to waste a whole future joy over so simple a business as warning a boat what are you telling me the truth as i always do and i advise you to believe it or twon't be the first time you've seen too far into a brick wall Wern knew well enough what captain john meant just a year before he had paid a surprise visit to the cove ferreted out a locked shed and asked to be shown what was inside the king refused it held nothing he said but provisions for his brother henry's vessel of course Wern couldn't believe this a locked store in prussia cove was much too sure a thing so first he argued and then he broke the door open and sure enough found innocent provisions inside just as he'd been promised next morning the shed was empty didn't i warn ee said john against breaking in that door and leaving my property exposed now i'll have to make ye pay for it and pay for it Wern did all i know the captain went on is that a methody preacher paid me a visit last night with the object so far as i can make out for things have been moving so fast i hadn't time to question him as i wished a teaching me what was due to king george in pursuance of which it being his majesty's birthday he took and fired a dozen rockets i keep on the off chance of wanting one of these days to signal the custom-house at penzance i own twas a funny thing to do but folks takes their patriotism different i dare say now you don't even remember twas his majesty's birthday Wern tried a fresh tack we'll take that yarn later on he said you can't deny a cargo was run this morning we'll allow it for the moment but that only proves that no boat was warned away and when i sent a boat in to capture it you deliberately opened fire in other words tried to murder me his majesty's representative tried to murder you look here captain john stepped to one of his still loaded guns and pointed it carefully at a plank floating out at the mouth of the cove a plank knocked by the cutter's guns out of uncle bill lego's taty patch and now drifting out to sea on the first of the ebb he pointed the gun carefully let fly and knocked the bit of wood to flinders that's what i do when i try he said why bless ye i was no more in earnest than you were this made Wern blush for his marksmanship but you'll have to prove that he said why damn said john carter and find himself another sixpence on the spot if you are so particular get out there in the boat again and i will well the upshot was that after some palaver Wern agreed to walk up to the captain's house and reckon the accounts between them he had missed a pretty haul and been openly defied on the other hand he hadn't a man hurt and he knew the king's government still owed john carter for a lugger he had lent two years before to chase a french privateer lying off ardevora carter had sent the lugger round at wern's particular request she was short-handed and after a running fight of three or four hours the frenchman put in a shot which sent her to the bottom and drowned fourteen hands for this as wern knew he had never received proper compensation i fancy the two came to an agreement to set one thing against another and call quits at any rate john was put to no further annoyance over that day's caper as for the preacher i'm told that no person in those parts ever set eyes on him again and anne Geen drove home that evening with her phoby beside her i'm sorry to let he go my son 
said john but twould never do for me to have your mother coming over here too often i've a great respect for all the lamals but on the female side they be too frolicsome for a steady-going trade like mine End of section 9section ten of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the white wolf and other fireside tales by sir arthur thomas quiller couch the man who could have told it was ten o'clock a sunny gusty morning in early september when h m s berenice second class cruiser left the hamoes and pushed slowly out into the sound on her way to the china seas from the hoe on a grassy slope below the great hotel john gilbart watched her as she thrust her long white side into view between devil's point and the wooded slopes of mount edgecombe watched her as she stole past drake's island and headed up the asia passage she kept little more than steerage way threading her path among anchored yachts gay with bunting and now and then politely slowing in the crowd of smaller craft under sail for it was regatta morning the tall club flagstaff behind and above gilbart's head wore its full code of signals with blue ensign on the gaff and blue burgee at the topmast head and fluttered them intermittently as the nor'westerly breeze broke down in flaws over the leads of the clubhouse below him half a dozen small boys with bundles of programmes came skirmishing up the hill through the sparse groups of onlookers off the promenade pier where the excursion steamers bumped and reeked and blew their sirens the committee ship lay moored in a moving swarm of rowboats dinghies and steam launches she flew her bee signal as yet but the seconds were drawing on toward the five-minute gun and beyond on the ruffled sound nine or ten yachts were manoeuvring and trimming their canvas two forty raiders dodging and playing through the opening stage of their duel for the start four or five twenties taking matters easy as yet all with jackyards hoisted to the eastward a couple of belated twenties came creeping out from their anchorage in caddowater all this gilbart's gaze took in with the stately merchantmen riding beyond the throng and the low breakwater three miles away and the blue horizon beyond all out of that blue from time to time came the low jarring vibration which told of an unseen gunboat at practice and from time to time a puff of white smoke from the picklecombe battery held him listening for its louder boom but he returned always to the berenice moving away up the asia passage so cautiously that between whiles she seemed to be drifting but always moving with the smoke blown level from her buff-coloured funnels with clean white sides and clean white ensign and here and there a sparkle of sunlight on rail or gun breech or torpedo tube she was bound on a three years cruise and gilbart who happened to know this and was besides something of a sentimentalist detected pathos in this departure on a festival morning it seemed to him as she swung round her stern and his quick eye caught the glint of her gilded name with the muzzle of her six-inch gun on the platform above foreshortened in the middle of its white screen like a bull's-eye in a target 
it seemed to him that this holiday throng took little heed of the three hundred odd men so silently going forth to do england's work and fight her battles on her deck yesterday afternoon he had shaken hands and parted with a friend a stoker on board and had seen some pitiful good-byes his friend casey to be sure was unmarried an unamiable man with a cynical tongue with no one to regret him and no disposition to make a fuss over a three years exile but at the head of the ship's ladder gilbart had passed through a group of red-eyed women one or two with babies at the breast it was not a pretty sight one poor creature had abandoned herself completely and rocked to and fro holding on by the bulwarks and bellowing aloud this and a vision of dirty wet handkerchiefs haunted him like a physical sickness gilbart considered himself an imperialist read his newspaper religiously and had shown great loyalty as secretary of a local sub-committee at the time of the queen's jubilee in collecting subscriptions among the dockyards men habitually he felt a lump in his throat when he spoke of the flag his calling that of lay assistant and auxiliary preacher at a pinch to a dockyard mission perhaps encouraged this surface emotion but by nature he was one of those who need to make a fuss to feel they are properly patriotic to his thinking every yacht in the sound should have dipped her flag to the berenice surely even a salute of guns would not have been too much but no that is the way england dismisses her sons without so much as a cheer he felt ashamed of this cold send-off ashamed for his countrymen what do they know or care he asked himself fastening his scorn on the backs of an unconscious group of country people who had raced one another uphill from an excursion steamer and halted panting and laughing halfway up the slope it irritated him the more when he thought of casey's pale derisive face he and casey had often argued about patriotism or rather he had done the arguing while casey sneered casey was a stoker and knew how fuel should be applied casey made no pretense to love england gilbart never quite knew why he tolerated him but so it was they had met in the reading-room of a sailor's home and had somehow struck up an acquaintance even a sort of unacknowledged friendship their common love of books may have helped for casey heaven knew where or how had picked up an education far above gilbart's and amazing in a common stoker also he wore some baffling attractive mystery behind his reserve once or twice certainly not half a dozen times he had at a casual word pulled open for an instant the doors of his heart and given gilbart a sensation of looking into a furnace into white hot depths sudden and frightening but what chiefly won him was the knowledge that in some perverse involuntary and quite inexplicable way he was liked by this sullen fellow who had no other friend and sought none he knew the liking to be there as surely as he knew it to be shy and sullen curt in expression contemptuous of itself had he ever troubled to examine himself honestly gilbart must have acknowledged himself casey's inferior in all but amiability and casey no doubt knew this but in friendship as in love there is usually one who likes and one who suffers himself to be liked and the positions are not allotted by merit gilbart a self-deceiver all his life had accepted the compliment complacently enough the berenice cleared the crowd and quickened her speed as the five-minute gun puffed out from the committee ship and the blue peter ran up the halyards in the smoke 
gilbart turned his attention upon the two big yachts and followed their movements until the starting gun was fired saw them haul up and plunge over the line so close together that the crews might have shaken hands watched them as they fluttered out their spinnakers for the run to the eastern mark for all the world like two great white moths floating side by side swiftly but with no show of hurry when he returned to the cruiser she was far away almost off the western end of the breakwater gone so far as he was concerned and whoever else might be watching her from the shore the parting over the threads torn and snapped her crew face to face now with the long voyage he drew a long breath and was aware for the first time of a woman standing about twenty yards on his left behind a group of chattering holiday-makers he saw at a glance that she did not belong to them but was gazing after the berenice a forlorn tearless figure with a handkerchief crumpled up into a ball in her hand affability was a part of gilbart's profession and besides he hated to see a woman suffer he edged toward her and lifted his hat i hope said he these persons are not annoying you they don't understand of course i too have a friend on the berenice the woman looked at him as though she heard but could not for the moment grasp what he said she tightened her grip on the handkerchief and kept her lips firmly compressed gilbart saw that though tearless her eyes wore traces of tears no redness but some swelling of the lids with dark semicircles underneath. To them, he went on, nodding toward the holiday keepers, it's only regard a day. To them, she's only a passing ship helping to make up the pretty scene. They know nothing of the gallant hearts she carries or the sore one she leaves behind. If they knew, I wonder if they'd care. The ordinary Anglo Saxon has so little imagination she was staring at him now and at length seemed to understand but with understanding there grew in her eyes a look of anger almost of repugnance oh please go away she said he lifted his hat and obeyed indeed he walked off to the farthest end of the hoe he was hurt he had a thin-skinned vanity and hated to look small even before a stranger that snub poisoned his morning and although he looked at the yachts his mind ran all the time upon the encounter to be sure he had brought it upon himself but he preferred to consider that he had meant kindly had obviously meant kindly he tried to invent a retort a gentle dignified retort which would have touched her to a regret for her injustice nothing more perhaps it was not yet too late to return and convey his protest under a delicate apology or perhaps the mere sight of him casually passing might move her to make amends he even strolled back some way with this idea but she had disappeared the berenice had vanished too around penley point no doubt he remembered the field glasses slung in a case by his hip and was fumbling with the leather strap when a drop of rain fell on his hand the herald of a smart shower a dark squall came whistling down the hamoes and standing there in the fringe of it he saw it strike and spread itself out like a fan over the open sound at his feet blotting the sparkle out of the water while some of the small boats heeled to it and others ran up into the wind and lay shaking it was over in five minutes and the sun broke out again before the rain ceased falling but Gilbert decided that there was more to follow. He had not come out to keep holiday, and an unfinished manuscript waited for him in his lodgings, an address on true manliness, to be delivered two evenings hence, in the mission room to lads under eighteen. Though he delivered them without manuscript, Gilbert always prepared his addresses carefully, and kept the fair copies in his desk. 
he lived in hope of being reported some day and then who could say but a book might be called for his lodgings lay midway down a long dreary street of small houses each with a small yard at the back each built of brick and stuccoed all as like as peas all inhabited by dockyards men or the families of gunners artificers and petty officers in the navy prospect place was its deceptive name and it ran parallel with three precisely similar thoroughfares grafton place alderney place and belvedere avenue these four with a cross street where the mission room stood facing a pawnbroker's comprised gilbart's field of labour he reached home a little after twelve ate his dinner and fell to work on his manuscript by half-past three he had finished all but the peroration gilbart prided himself on his perorations and knowing from experience that it helped him to ideas and phrases he caught up his hat and went out for a walk during that walk he did indeed catch and fix the needed sentences but as it happened he was never afterward able to recall one of them all he remembered was that much rain must have fallen for the pavements which had been dry in the morning were glistening and the roadways muddy and with standing puddles on his way homeward each of these puddles reflected the cold pure light of the dying day until prospect place might have been a street in the new jerusalem paved with jasper beryl and chrysoprase so much he remembered and also that his feet must have taken him back to the hoe where the crowd was thicker and the regatta drawing to an end a few yachts only left to creep home under a greenish sky out of which the wind was fast dying he had paused somewhere to listen to a band he could give no further account to himself for this was what had happened as he entered his lodgings and closed the front door the letter-box behind it fell open and he saw a sealed envelope lying inside he picked it out and read the address mrs wilcox he called down the passage when did this come mrs wilcox appearing at the kitchen door and wiping her hands could not tell the midday post or else the three o'clock there were no others come to think of it she had heard a postman's knock when she was dishing up the dinner but had supposed it to be next door it sounded like next door gilbart took the letter upstairs with him the address was in casey's handwriting queer fellow casey he broke the seal in the little bay window just like him though to shake hands yesterday without a spark of feeling and then send his good-byes to reach me after he was well on his way he drew out the enclosure unfolded it and saw that the paper bore the printed address of the sailor's home where casey dossed when ashore and where writing paper was supplied gratis couldn't have come ashore after i left him he'd paid his bill at the rest and his bag was aboard must have had this in his pocket all the time might just as well have handed it to me with instructions not to open it and saved the stamp what a secretive old chap it is he held the letter close to his eyes in the waning daylight dear john by the time this reaches you we shall have started and by then or a little later i shall have gone and the baroness with me if you ask where i don't know but it is where we shall never meet you serve your country in your own way i am going to serve mine perhaps i shall also be serving yours for it is only by striking terribly and without warning that the brave men in this world can get even with the cowards who make its laws one thing i envy you you'll be alive to see the rage of the sheep i am playing this hand alone and without help so when your silly newspapers begin to cry out about secret societies you will know i never belonged to one in my life 
i think i am sorriest about the way you'll think of me but that makes no real difference because i know it to be foolish i have the stuff on board and the little machine i cannot fix the time to an hour up or down but you may take it for sure that some time between ten p m and midnight the berenice will be at the bottom of the sea with yours p c while john gilbert read this there was silence in the stuffy little room and for some minutes after then he stepped to the mantelpiece for the matchbox and candle a small ormolu clock ticked there and while he groped for the matches he put out a hand to stop the noise which had suddenly grown intolerable he desisted remembering that he did not know how the clock worked that mrs wilcox who wound it up religiously on monday mornings was proud of it and anyway that wasn't the machine he wanted to stop he found a match lit it and held it close to the letter the match burned low scorched his fingers he dropped it in the fender where it flickered out just missing the waterfall of shavings with which mrs wilcox decorated her fireplace in the summer months he did not light another but went back to the window and stood there quite still down the street to the westward over the wet roofs still glimmering in the twilight one pale green rift divided the heavy clouds and in that rift the last of the daylight was dying across the way in the house facing him a woman was lighting a lamp as a rule the inhabitants of prospect place did not draw the blinds of their upper rooms until they closed the shutters also and went to bed and gilbert looked straight into the little parlour but he saw nothing he was trying vainly trying to bring his mind to it nothing really big had happened to him before and his first feeling characteristically selfish was that this terrible thing had risen up to alter the rest of his life he must disentangle himself get away to a distance and have a look at it his brain was buzzing yes there it rose like a black wall between this moment and all the hours to come a brute barrier stretching clean across the prospect again and again he brought his mind up to it as you might coax a horse up to a fence again and again it refused each time in the last few steps his heart froze extending its chill until every separate faculty hung back springless and inert and there was no getting round why had this happened to him of all people it never for a moment occurred to him to doubt casey's word he saw it now hideous as the deed was casey was capable of it had always been capable of it let it go for a miserable tribute to casey's honesty in the past that gilbart accepted the infernal statement at once and without suspicion he knew now that from the bottom of their intercourse this candid devil had been grinning up at him all the time only his own cowardly comfortable habit of seeing the world as he wished it had kept his eyes turned from the truth men don't as a rule commit crimes not one man in millions translates himself into a crime of this sort the odds against his daring it are only to be told in millions yet it had happened man or devil casey never paltered with his creed if the world differed from him then it was casey against the world a hopeless business for him yet he would get in a blow if possible and casey had got in his blow the incredible had happened but gilbert groaned why it had happened to him in his stupefaction he returned again and again upon this catching in the flood at that one little straw of self not inhumanly as callous to the ruin of others but pitifully meanly because it was the one thing familiar in the roar and din he cursed casey cursed him for betraying his friendship the man had no right 
he pulled up suddenly with a laugh after all casey had played the game had faced the music and would go down with the berenice one soul against three hundred and fifty perhaps not what you would call atonement but after all the best he had to offer wonder how many samson pulled down with him at gaza wonder if the bible says beg pardon mr gilbart it was mrs wilcox standing in the doorway with his tea on a tray it it was nothing he stammered she must have heard his laugh talking to yourself i often hear you at it over your sermons and things sometimes at your dressing too i hears you when i'm in here doing up the room you'd like the lamp lit i suppose she set down the tray not just yet well it's a bad habit reading with your meals it's not worth while to bring a lamp i must drink my tea in a hurry and run out i have an engagement he heard her go out and close the door casey had no right it was a betrayal if the man were bent on this infernal crime put the atrocity of it aside for a moment call it just an ordinary crime but why need he have written that letter why involve him well not involve perhaps still there was a kind of responsibility his eyes had been fastened on the little parlour across the road the woman after lighting the lamp had set it in the centre of a round table and left the room between this table and the hearth an old man sat in an armchair smoking his pipe and reading a newspaper the back of the chair was turned toward the window but over it gilbart could see the crown of a grey head and small steady puffs of smoke ascending between it and the upper edge of the paper a light appeared in the room above the light of a candle behind the drawn blind it lasted there perhaps for ten minutes and once the woman's shadow moved across the blind the light went out and after a minute or two the woman reappeared in the parlour she carried a work-basket and after speaking a word with the old man in the chair she set the basket down on the table drew up a chair and began to darn a child's stocking now and then she looked up as if listening for some sound or movement in the room overhead but after a moment or two began to ply her needle again the needle moved more slowly stopped she bowed her head over the stocking gilbart knew why she was the wife of a petty officer on the berenice the old man in the chair went on reading all this while a light had been growing in gilbart's brain and now he saw in this street and the next and the next lived scores who had sons husbands brothers on board the berenice thin walls of brick and plaster dividing to-night their sore hearts and their prayers a whole town with its hopes and its happy days given into keeping of one ship not its love only but its trust for life's smallest comforts following her as she moved away through the darkness and he alone knew he had only to throw open the window to fling four words into that silent street to shout the berenice is lost and with the breath of it windows would fly open partitions fall down and all those privacies meet and answer in one terrible outcry he put up a hand to thrust it away this awful gift of power he would have none of it he was unfit oh my god it was he not casey who held the real infernal machine it was here not in the berenice that the leaven must fall and he john gilbart held it in his fingers oh my god i am unfit thrust not this upon me but there was no escape he must take his hat and run run to the port admiral the errand was useless he knew for all the while at the back of his soul's confusion some practical corners of his brain had been working at the problem of time 
was there time to follow and prevent there was not he knew the berenice's natural speed to be eighteen knots put it at sixteen fifteen even still not the fastest destroyer in the port following in a bee-line could overtake her by midnight and there might be must be delays yet god too might interfere some providential accident might delay the cruise he must run at any rate he picked up his hat and ran now that he was taking action doing something the worst horror of responsibility left him for a while he seemed to have cast some of it already off his own shoulders and on to the admiral's as he ran he found time to think of casey casey was doing this thing not in hatred or in villainy for gain but because it seemed to him right right or at least necessary casey was laying down his own life in the deed how could man framed in god's image expect ultimate good out of devilish cruelty yet from the world's beginning men had murdered and tortured each other on this only plea had butchered women and the very babes had stamped upon god's image and marvel of marvels for its soul's salvation not for their own advantage at every stride gilbart felt his moral footing trusted for years without question cracking and crumbling and swirling away in blocks red flames leaped into the fissures and filled them the end of the world had surely come but he must run to the admiral he kept that uppermost in his mind and ran the windows of the admiralty house blazed with light the admiral's wife was giving a dinner and a dance and already a small crowd had gathered to see the earlier guests arrive the sight dashed gilbart suddenly he remembered that the letter had reached him by the afternoon post it was now half past seven and he would have to explain the interval for of course the admiral would suspect the whole story at first gilbart knew the official manner he had been privileged to study the fine flower of it in this particular admiral one afternoon six months before when the great man had condescended to sit on the platform at the mission anniversary tut tut a stupid practical joke that would be the beginning and then would follow cross-examination in the coldest court-martial fashion well he could explain but it would be just as well to have the story pat beforehand one minute ten minutes went by cabs rattled up in private carriages officers in glittering uniforms ladies muffled in silk and swans down stepped past the policeman behind whom gilbart hesitated this would never do better he had gone in with the story hot on his lips he twitched the policeman's elbow may i pass please i want to see the admiral that's likely ain't it but i have a message for him an urgent one one that won't keep a moment why i have seen you hanging round here this quarter hour with these very eyes won't keep here you get out i tell you oh deliver us the policeman interrupted what's the matter with you come to keep the admiral's dinner cold while you hand over command of the channel fleet he winked heavily at one or two of the nearest in the crowd and they laughed gilbert eyed them savagely he had a word in his mouth which would stop their laughing and for one irrational moment he was near speaking it near launching against half a dozen loafers the bolt which only to hold and handle had aged him ten years in an hour the word was even on his tongue when a carriage passed and at its open window a young girl leaned forward and looked out on the crowd her face in the light of the entrance lamp was exquisitely fair delicately rose and white as the curved inner lip of a sea-shell 
at her throat where her cloak collar fell back a little showing its quilted lining of pale blue satin a diamond necklace shimmered and a rosebud of diamonds in her hair sparkled so that it seemed to dance it caught gilbart's eye and somehow it seemed to lift and remove her and the house she was entering the lit windows the guests the admiral himself into another world if it were real then like enough this fragile thing this dresden goddess owned a brother perhaps a lover on board the berenice if so here was another world waiting to be shattered a world of silks and toys and pretty uniforms and tiny bric-a-brac a sort of doll's house inhabited by angels at play but could it be real could such a world exist and be liable as his own to it could the same brutal touch destroy this fabric and the sordid privacies of prospect place all in a run like a row of card houses never ye mind him mr gilbart said a voice at his elbow and he turned and looked in the face of a girl who in an interval of dressmaking had once helped him with his district work him the paler milly sanders nodded and it flashed on gilbart that the policeman's joke the carriage the girl's face and these thoughts of his had all gone by in something less than ten seconds he've got the ump to-night that's what's the matter with him and milly sanders nodded again reassuringly what are you doing here gilbart asked me oh it's in the way of business as you might say i comes here to pick up ints i suppose now you thought twasn't very feelin hearted and my dick gone away foreign only this morning he remembered now that the girl's zeal for mission work had cooled ever since she had been walking out with her dick a young stoker in the berenice i reckon that's the last of the dinner guests the others won't be comin much before ten well i'm off to the o there's going to be fireworks and that's the best place for seein in the way of business too i suppose said gilbart and wondered how he could say it milly giggled you had me there she confessed but what's the good to give way i'm sure with conviction it's just what dick would like me to do i'm going anyway so long she paused that is unless you'd like to come along too it was after all astonishingly easy even if he found and convinced the admiral nothing could be done why then should he hasten all this misery was it not rather an act of large mercy to hold back the news say that by holding his tongue he delayed it by twenty-four hours life after all was made up of days and not so very many of them by silence then it stood to reason he gained from woe a clear day for hundreds meanwhile here stood one of those hundreds might he not give her under the very shadow of fate an hour or two of actual positive happiness he told himself this knowing all the while that he lied he knew that the thing was easier to put off than to do he knew that he took milly's arm in his not to comfort her although he meant to do this too but to drug his own conscience and because he was mad yes mad for human company and support for hours it seemed for weeks he had been isolated alone with that secret and his own soul he could bear it no longer he must ease the torment only for a little then perhaps he would go back to the admiral chatter was what he wanted the sound of a fellow-creature's voice babbling no matter what he knew also that he bought this respite at a price and the price must be paid terribly when he came to wake and yet he found it astonishingly easy to take milly's arm but i say she rattled on you must be soft why 
he was drinking in the sound of her words letting the sense run by him why do you suppose the admiral would see you at this time what was it about please go on talking well i am what did you want to see the admiral for some mission business i suppose oh you needn't tell if you don't choose i'm not dying to hear they stood side by side on the hoe watching the fireworks three or four searchlights were playing over the sound turned now upon the anchored craft now upward following the rockets and again downward criss-crossing their white rays as if to catch the dropping multi-coloured stars Ooh! exclaimed milly as each shower of rockets exploded but what makes you jump like that i say he asked after a time since we've come to enjoy ourselves why not do the thing thoroughly what do you say to the theatre after this the theatre well you are getting on that would be heavenly they've got the charity girl on this week gertie lennox dancing but don't you disapprove of that sort of thing so i i mean i don't make practice of it but perhaps once in a way i love it though tisn't often i get the chance i don't know what dick would say though she said it archly meaning to suggest that dick might be jealous john gilbart misunderstood but that's foolish why not to-night as well as any other night what difference can it make to-to he broke off laughing a little wildly we'll go and give each other moral support we'll take tickets for the pit no the dress circle the dress circle there was awe in milly's voice her hand went up to her head they make you take your ad off there oh i couldn't but he caught her by the arm and hurried her off almost at a run the girl giggling and panting and beginning to enjoy herself amazingly the performance had begun but they found seats in the front row of the dress circle almost before she had ceased panting and milly was unpinning her hat and glancing up at the gallery on the chance of an envious friendly recognition the lights the colours the clash of brass and the orchestra made gilbart's head spin a stout tenor robusto in the uniform of a naval lieutenant was parading the stage in halos of mauve and green limelight and bawling his own praises to a semicircle of females gilbart's ear caught and retained but a line or two of their shrill chorus through the world so wide he's old england's pride but we're glad now he's come back for he's dressed in blue and he's always true heaven bless you dear old jack the sentiments of this ditty did not materially differ from those which gilbart was in the habit of assimilating from his morning newspaper nor were they much more fatuously expressed twenty-four hours ago he might even have applauded them as noisily as any one in the enraptured house now his gourds rose against the song the complacent singer the men and women who could be amused by such things could this be what they called the joy of living milly's eyes had begun to sparkle he forgot that in this very contempt the theatre was providing what he had come to seek a drug for conscience and before he recognized this the drug was weakening horribly stealthily it began to reassert itself these people what would happen if he stood up in this place and shouted it his mind played with the temptation he saw white faces men standing and looking up at him the performance on the stage arrested the orchestra mute almost he heard his voice ring out over the sudden frozen consternation no he gripped the velvet cushion before him i must sit it out i will sit it out and he did though he suffered horribly 
Millie found him a desperately dull companion, but luckily her neighbor's dresses and ornaments diverted her between the acts. She would have liked an orange, but it appeared that oranges were not eaten in the dress circle. Outside the theatre door in the great portico, Gilbert flung up both hands and let out a long, shuddering sigh. "'My, what's the matter with you?' asked Milly. "'Come along and have some supper.' He led her to a supper-room. "'Well, you do know how to do things,' she said. But it frightened her when he ordered champagne. She looked at him nervously. "'I've never tasted it,' she confessed. "'And,' with a glance around the room, "'and I don't think I like it.' She drank her glassful, however, while he finished the pint bottle. Then she picked up her worn gloves. "'Must we be going?' The end had come, and worse torment must begin. "'Of course we must, and I time, too, if you know what Mother'll say when I get home. You mustn't think I haven't enjoyed myself, though,' she added, "'because I have.' out in the street as they walked arm in arm she unbent still further i shall tell mother of course she won't mind when she knows it's you because you're so respectable but girls have to be careful at her door she paused before saying good-night she loved dick of course but she wondered a little what mr gilbart meant his manner had been so queer when he said must we be going for a moment she waited half expecting him to say something meaning to be angry if he said it such was her crude idea of coquettishness but john gilbart merely shook hands waited until the door closed behind her and bent his steps toward home that was in the next street he walked briskly up to the door then turned on his heel and strode away rapidly he could not go upstairs could not face the silent hours alone as he retreated the front door was opened mrs wilcox had been sitting up for him and had heard and recognized his footstep he ran after a minute the door was closed again at nine o'clock next morning a sentry on the seaward side of Trigantel Fort saw a man sitting below in the sunshine on the edge of the cliff, and took him for a tramp. It was John Gilbart. He had spent the night trudging the streets, but always returning to the pavement in front of one or the other of the two important newspaper offices. Lights shone in the upper windows of each, but all was quiet and he saw the men leave one by one and walk away into darkness with brisk but regular footfall a little before dawn he had caught the newspaper train for the west left it at the first station over the cornish border and set his face toward the sea his walk took him past dewy hedgerows over which the larks sang but he neither saw nor heard a deep peace had fallen upon him he knew himself now had touched the bottom of his cowardice his falsity he would never be happy again but he could never deceive himself again no not though god interfered he looked out on the sunshine with purged eyes now and then he listened as if for some sound from the horizon or the great town behind him had god interfered how still the world was end of section 10